evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome, 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 everyone. I'm so glad that you uh, came back. Or for those of you who are with us for the first time, welcome to Baggage Claim. Unpack your bags with Dr. Danita. We are in week six already. And tonight we have a, a great topic and I'm going to introduce our guest in a moment. But before I do so, I just want to say some of the things that we say weekly. If this has been beneficial for you, please do like and share, share with everyone. This information is absolutely essential to get out to everyone that you know. It's valuable. The topic tonight, um, everyone needs to hear this information and everyone needs to be a part of this topic. So please like and share. None of these episodes are meant to replace or meant to be a substitute for professional counseling. Some of these topics get to be, can be triggering, um, but we want you to know you can take a step away, um, but definitely use this information as educational purposes. We try to offer some tips for you to move forward with what we are sharing, but again, it's not meant to uh, be a substitute for professional counseling. And so thank you so much for joining. Come on in and we're going to introduce our guest for the evening. And tonight um, we have with us Dr. Fred Dombrowski. And thank you so much for coming on, Fred. Um, tonight's topic is white fragility and becoming anti-racist. And so we know that this kind of topic, Fred, can be uh, very um, sensitive. It's a, a difficult topic to talk about. And so I'm so, 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 so thankful for you coming on tonight. And so I just want to say, just to um, let the viewers know that you and I did meet about seven years ago and we were working uh, towards our, um, we were in our doctoral studies and we had a few classes together. And then when we got on that journey for um, to actually begin writing our dissertation, we found that we had two bonds, one, we were in the throes of the dissertation and so many people couldn't understand exactly what that meant. And so we bonded together, you I, and, and Annette and myself, and she couldn't be on tonight. And But we had that Christian bond. And I'll never forget when we uh, decided that we really needed to do something to support each other. And we came up with that prayer group. And I am so thankful that after 2016 and we graduated and we walked across that stage we got hooded we never stopped the prayer friend mm -hmm. we continued and to this day we have our monday morning prayer and so i i'm so um grateful for our connection and our relationship and so just tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and um then we'll get started Sounds good. And uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, I cannot stress enough, like, you know, when you talk about that Monday morning prayer, it's it really like knowing that you're not alone, knowing that like there are people there that support you, even though we're disconnected by space, just knowing that we're not walking in through anything alone. So uh, I am Fred Dombrowski and uh, I, uh, it's funny, I, I videotaped my uh, graduation uh, for uh, when we became doctors and I think you graduated right after me. So on the video, on YouTube, there, you will also get hooded on the video as well. Oh, so wow. if you go, if you uh, go on YouTube and look for a PhD in counselor education and supervision, you, it's, there's a video of you getting hooded on there oh, that's so, awesome. with I'm me. So yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, so I've been working in the field of mental health since uh, 1998. I was really lucky to uh, uh, get uh, my foot in the door of the Buffalo Psych Center when I was like working on an associate's degree and then I uh, got a bachelor's in psychology, uh, followed up with my master's in mental health counseling in 2006. I became a licensed mental health counselor in 2009 and returned uh, back to school in 2013 to get the PhD in counselor education and supervision. I'm currently a full-time professor at the University of Bridgeport. Uh, as I am a licensed mental health counselor and licensed alcohol and drug counselor, I've worked in multiple uh, clinical 
treatment settings, including uh, inpatient and outpatient treatment. I've been a counselor, I've been a director, uh, and I've also worked with forensic populations as I was a director at a forensic hospital. I specialize in cognitive behavioral therapy, and I also specialize in the mental health care of transgender individuals as well. So there's a lot of uh, really good stuff, and specifically during the last year, as I am a uh, board certified telemental health provider, through the American Mental Health Counseling Association, we've been trying to uh, assist counselors across the country as people have moved from traditional face-to-face -face means of providing counseling to telehealth because of COVID. Thank you so much. Wow, you know, um, when we got your, your picture and asked for your credentials, you had so many letters behind your name. I'm so proud of you. Fred. Yeah. You have done so much. I, I feel like you had the alphabet twice behind your name. And we definitely couldn't fit it all. But I, I mean, you've always been, you know, the achiever. And I'm, you know, just really proud of your accomplishments accomplishments and all that you have um, acquired since we walked across that stage. And so we're going to get into our topic on tonight. If you're just coming in, please do like and share. Definitely share with everyone that you know. Tonight's topic is white fragility and becoming anti-racist. Some of the um, what we're sharing on tonight is in reference to the book white fragility and that was written by um, robin d'angelo and then some of it is based on the book Be how to become an anti-racist by ibram kendi and so when i when i um think about the book that robin d'angelo wrote she is writing from an insider's perspective as a white woman and um, she talks about her role as a diversity trainer, and she really unapologetically uses her whiteness um, as, and her status to challenge this concept of racism. And so we're going to talk about um, that tonight and talk about questions around uh, racism and and the challenge that is often um, felt in the white community to talk about the topic. She, Robin D'Angelo has gotten a lot of flack for her book. Um, it has actually made the number one um, sellers list, but she has gotten a lot of flack, a lot of flack from white people. She says that they immediately become defensive um, when talking about whiteness um, having actually having a meaning because according to Robin, she says that white people tend to um, really have actually never really have been challenged about being white. They hadn't, hadn't been challenged about their whiteness and in her role as a diversity trainer, she finds that that's you know, what she is doing, just challenging uh, the the participants who are white about what it means to be white. And so when I think about um, our, you know, relationship, I, I don't know that we've had a lot of conversations about, you know, about you and, uh, and, and growing up as, you know, a white man. Um, so if, if you had to kind of like just think about some of the uh, your thoughts about what it means to have come into the familiarity or awareness of, you know, being white and, and how that uh, uh, connects with your relationship with Black people. Um, what, what are some of the things that you would share? Yeah, absolutely. And um, when you talk about the difficulties of having a discussions like this, it's it's kind of tough because uh, like, uh, even though I'm a professor and even though I've talked about, uh, I've done a lot of training specifically on cultural diversity and assessing our own internal reactions, um, the, I'm still a work in progress. And so uh, I may not say everything that's absolutely perfect. So I'm definitely learning as well. So I just really appreciate the ability to be on here. And I think when, you know, I, I really uh, appreciate that question. Uh, and especially from the conception that um, I think, um, with the book kind of describes is the difficulty of talking about like race interactions and what it means to be racist. Mm -hmm. So for uh, for myself growing up, I was uh, my mom had five kids 
And when I was born, my uh, father had left the house and I never met my father. And uh, in a small way, that didn't really bother me too much because I, I didn't have the opportunity to miss him. Whereas my siblings, they knew him, they were much older and it, they were definitely impacted by his leaving. And at that time, <clears throat> we were living on the east side of Buffalo and that was, uh, it was transitioning from a predominantly Polish to predominantly African American and Jewish neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So, uh, while my mom was a single mother, we had to rely on like the, the assistance of the community in many ways. Like people that would help us get haircuts, people that would help take my mom, uh, driving, like our churches. We really needed a lot of help. So at a very young age, we, I was not, I did not have the experience of only seeing white people. I had, uh, I had the experience of like, and I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, my first interactions with black people or the times where I, I recognize there's a difference between white people and black people and the ridiculous questions I asked as a three-year-old child. And, uh, but also not only that, but also Jewish people hearing about the uh, differences in customs and, tra and traditions and also, uh, gay people, uh, the people that would cut our hair, people that would be supportive. And, um, this was something that was presented to me at a very young age. And I remember like my reactions to otherness, like as a child and specifically my mom's like extreme dishappiness with my otherness types of responses. And, uh, I think that I like, uh, from considering like our perspective, a lot of that was like, we were Polish, like we're of Polish descent. And as we were like, I, uh, our grandparents still had family members who were still in Poland uh, during World War II. So uh, within that time, it was something that like, you know, racism just wasn't, well, racism as we conceptualized it back in the 1980s wasn't something that was allowed within specifically in the family. But we never had a discussion specific, specifically about what racism is, what racism looks like. Looks like it was more imposed that for us, it was important not to judge the individual by the color of their skin, but judge the individual by the content of their character. And that's a, that's, I think, one of those foundational aspects of what makes a conversation like this so difficult because people can say, you know, I don't judge people by the color of their skin while still doing things that have like microaggression, while still mm -hmm. like uh, being disconnected from instances of oppression or, or wrongdoings that are happening. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I remember reading that um, one of the things that Robin said that over the years in her diversity work, and I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, some of the things that, that you're sharing in, in understanding otherness and, and some of the, uh, the comments that you made. And she said that um, over the years, one of the things that she heard over and over again from the um, participants in her workshop that, you know, people were justifying and they would get very concerned about her making statements that, you know, white people are racist and, and kind of over, she felt they felt that she was overgeneralized. They felt she was overgeneralizing this whole concept of white people being um, racist. And so she says that their justification for not being racist was, um, well, I have black friends and I grew up in a black neighborhood and, or, you know, I mean, I had other black people in my neighborhood or um, I was always taught to be, to treat everyone equally. What can you speak to as it relates to those justifications that have been heard and does it really justify that one is not racist? Sure. So, uh, and uh, I want to go back to like, um, as I described, like how my mom like instilled on me, like we, it's not appropriate to judge someone by the color of the skin, more in the content of their character. And, uh, one of the, when we were talking about potential questions for tonight, I do like, I really like had to like rethink about like just a bunch of like random stupid things I thought and said. And uh, um, while we're taught, uh, and this is why it's really tough because like I, I can't speak for, I'm never going to try to speak for every white individual out there. I could mm -hmm. speak for myself and say that like for us, like the word racism is such a uh, vile world, vile word. And uh, racism is an action, it's the verb which also 
is synonymous with murder, abuse, and rape, uh, because uh, uh, those things have happened at the hands of people who are openly racist. And you know, it happened in Nazi Germany. It happened uh, in the early American history. For sure, those things happen. So when someone confronts someone with that, it's a very hard thing to say. And that doesn't mean that although I I've had black friends, it doesn't mean that I haven't had a r ridiculous thought where I'm not judging someone by the their character. I'm judging them by the color of their skin. And like one of the one of the ridiculous things I was thinking about, like in my like recollection is um, like I, I, I do not feel like ashamed of, because of some aspects of my white culture. Like I love heavy metal. I love hockey. Like those are things that are traditionally white. I'm okay with liking that. But even within those aspects, uh, growing up in Buffalo, being a Buffalo Sabres fan, remember back in the eighties, we got Grant Fear. He was like one of the best goalies and uh, one of his parents was black. And the the response people were saying, "Oh, he's great for a black guy." And why yeah. can't he just be great? Like, and that would be one of those instances where, like, we're not supposed to judge someone by the color of their skin, but what their like their content of their character. And there would all, be all these like classifiers or qualifiers, like, right. uh, and those things that those things kind of contradict the idea of judging someone based on the on their character we can't just say he's a good goalie that this other aspect had to kind of come in so i mean it's not it's not like we're doing it to like identify someone like i'm looking for my friend my friend is black he's six foot tall we're not describing like that we're saying he's a great goalie i can't believe he's black there's like those things right there and right. i we can see people say those things regardless of who their friends are and those things do come out and the and when someone says that they're not fully aware as to like how is saying that it can be oppressive. Like, what are you trying to say? Like, I, I, I this, he's not allowed to play hockey. Like, it, it, where is this coming from? Does that mean that, like, because of this, that he should not be valued? And also, uh, at that time, too, there was a, I don't know if this happened, but there was a rumor that uh, during his time in Buffalo, like, he attempted to, like, just play golf at one of their country clubs, and people were giving him crap. And they had no idea that he was the goalie for the Buffalo Sabres. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I do know that that was something that was talked about at that time but even little stuff like that i mean it still happens yeah it still happens absolutely and uh for my work specific with transgender people when someone has transitioned and if they inform someone like hey you know i i'm transgender people say oh my god i never i never would have guessed and that should come off as like a good thing and it still comes off as invalidating so having friends having family members that alone doesn't mean that we still don't have work to do to get through those things Right, right. And the things that you are, are sharing, I think that there is, well, I know that there's a difference between prejudging people, the stereotypes, being prejudiced, um, discrimination. There, there's a difference um, between that and being racist. And, and you hit the nail on the head. Uh, what Robin D'Angelo was trying to um, mitigate was that whole thought of racism being um, so an individual who is mean or an individual who is intentional or an individual who um, be, um, who intentionally is saying, I don't like you because of the color of your skin. And the things that you shared, the microaggressions that you were just sharing were primarily due to ignorance. It wasn't that one was um, just out, outright being mean about you know prejudging someone or making statements that would fall under that category of microaggressions. So um, when Robin D'Angelo um, wrote this book, White Fragility, what what did she mean when she used the term fragility? So uh, from my understanding, I think that th th what it means is like a defensiveness that uh, white people may experience when someone calls them racist. And I completely respect how someone would feel defensive. Uh, it makes sense because the things that are associated with racism. And uh, when we're talking about the work of the second author, like being anti-racist, mm -hmm. if the bar is only to not be racist, like I can't, like I said, I can't speak for everyone, but I know the people, like the people in my own small little bubble. I think one of the things that kind of helps us glob together is like, you know, being racist has never been something which has been acceptable. With that said, on those ongoing like small statements where we didn't understand what, what we were saying was racist, those ongoing like instances where there was disconnection uh, from the experiences of individuals from other cultures, those things have happened. 
and those things are absolutely there. And so I think when she talks about like that fragility aspect, it's really hard for me to to hear like severe words such as like racism mm -hmm. or like white supremacy because those things are so at the core like, counter my own like core beliefs and my spiritual beliefs. So when someone, especially someone I don't know, like, so like I've known you for seven years, you can pull me off to the side and say, Fred, you know, uh, X, Y, and Z, one, two, three. And I'd be willing to hear it because you know me. Right. It's hard when someone I don't know is saying these things about someone that they've never met. And also like within the book, she utilizes her own experience for reasoning. So I, that's hard to hear. So, yeah. and uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think it's definitely helpful for people that we do know, people that we can't connect with to help. But I, I just, I, that's one thing I do kind of struggle with. Like, I don't feel comfortable judging any person like I've never met. And as, and when we talk about like generalizations, uh, you and I, we've worked in the field long enough, especially in, in human services. I think about um, some instances where I've seen uh, white children be adopted by black families. And uh, for the experience of those children, I think if those children were, uh, as uh, she described, racist, I wonder what that would then mean to the parenting or how the parents would feel, uh, the adoptive parents. So I, I always struggle about like making generalizations. But with that said, though, I definitely think that there are instances, and I'm not trying to justify anything, but this is like mm -hmm. those, those instances where like I feel kind of defensiveness and yeah. it's just normal for me to feel it you know and that's that's what pops into mind but with that though most important thing is like i have to assess myself i can't tell anyone else what to do i can't tell anyone else that they're wrong or they're right i, I think most importantly i have to ask myself like really what am i doing what am i thinking what what things do i still hold on to and can there be things that i am doing that are making the world not a better place through my inaction and the answer is absolutely yes, of course. Yeah, I think, um, well, I can definitely appreciate you being honest when you say, you know, that there is that slight bit of defensiveness. I think that she um, <clears throat> she wanted the, she wanted the, the collective to understand that this is not an individual one by one, because she even said, I don't know everybody. I can't say that everyone individually has not worked on their, you know, their um, ideologies as it relates to Black people and, their, and, and the concept of racism. So she did make it a little broader in um, her definition saying, as a collective, this is a systemic thing. This is the, the white power. And because you identify as white, it puts you in the category collectively um, as a white person that white people are the ones that hold power and that white people are the ones that have the authority over legal systems and over institutional control. And what she wants collectively um, white people to do is take ownership as a collective, not necessarily, you know, this is who I am individually. I'm, I'm not this mean person. And, and I think she tries to make that clear over and over again, but if people get stuck with the the word racist, they'll have a very difficult um, time being able to take on the concept of the collective. So what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I, I think you kind of, yeah, I think you described it like perfectly. So when I think about like uh, the collective, and one of the things that she even mentioned is like, you know, uh, white people, we've had the luxury of not considering whiteness. Like I, I'm Fred. I never thought of myself first as a white guy. Mm -hmm. I'm just Fred. And that is one of the luxuries that a lot of white people experience. And I think like some white individuals, uh, especially myself, like in regards to growing up, I was taught not to see color. From a counseling perspective, though, if I'm like working with someone, I have to uh, be uh, able to understand things that have impacted that individual, lack of connection to services, how the individual may have been marginalized, and then I had to, or I had to relearn, uh, I had to relearn cultural aspects even within American culture, which I was taught not to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And these are instances which kind of 
the challenge. And when you talk about like a collective as a whole, I think that as a whole, there are still like just ongoing instances of marginalization, things that are happening uh, all throughout the country. And this isn't even like with, uh, this isn't even only with like relationship to African Americans, but marginalized cultures and also needs even of, uh, and uh, I feel awkward about saying this, but if we think about even the needs of men, uh, as the needs of men have changed, like uh, we were having a meeting with the university this past uh, week and what we saw is like, uh, the research shows that men uh, have now uh, have attended college at far fewer rates than would have happened before and have lower college uh, success rates. And to so that's a population that needs uh, needs additional help. Now, in ad addition to that, then there's uh, marginalized men and the rates are even lower about people uh, coming through. So I hope we can then meet them. So there are a lot of things I think that have slipped by the wayside. And also too, like uh, part of like my upbringing, you can have a spiritual belief, which we like read about. And then we could have like a cultural belief that keeps hitting us regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, so like uh, within my core belief, I would say, you know, it's important to advocate for people that are being treated wrong. While something that was in also instilled on me is like, if it doesn't bother you, stay out of trouble. Mm. And those things kind of contradict mm -hmm. because when people are being hurt, when people are being marginalized, when people's rights are being impacted, there's that first thought, all right, okay, like, how is this impacting me? Do I have all the information? How should I act? And those things are in direct opposition. And unfortunately, a lot of, when you talk about like systemic racism, when we think about like, uh, I think about if we're looking at systemic racism in the context of like right now, there's ongoing things that have happened for hundreds of years, which I don't want to ever be judgmental towards people, but a lot of things may have seemed right at the time, but then looking at like, oh my God, like the, what happened as a result of these uh, policies and procedures and specifically how it has worsened uh, I don't, I like our country and also the experiences of marginalized populations, it, th those things aren't good. And it is part of our job too. When you say when I say our job, I mean like definitely I would say a white person's job to advocate specifically on behalf of marginalized populations, and there are varying ways of doing that. That doesn't necessarily mean um, that doesn't mean you have to punch someone in the face if they don't agree with you. But uh, for my work specifically with forensics and also working with drug and alcohol counseling, um, if someone, if, especially if we consider like drug and alcohol uh, use, if an individual is coming from uh, an environment where they had less resources, their parents were in jail, uh, there was um, policies which set up their parents to be in jail, the individual is disconnected from supports, of course they're going to use substances. That person then gets put on probation and they don't have the resources, so then they relapse. I was the guy that was advocating with the probation officer to keep the person in treatment instead of sending the person to jail because we want the person to improve and that and going to jail is not going to improve. And I was... Yeah, I can't speak for every like law enforcement officer, but I was very lucky that my persuasiveness was helpful. But those are just like small instances. I mean, there's macro instances, there's bigger things, but there's those are. I think it is important to advocate and be involved. And if you don't know, it's okay to say I don't know. I think that's even better. Like uh, one of the one of the things I was reading about, like um, uh, from the author of White Racism, she was talking about like her frustration with white liberals, and like how white liberals were like, oh yeah, like I already know all this stuff, and there's like that lack of flexibility. Yeah. I want to hear, like I I think it's important for me to hear. And one of the you know uh, as uncomfortable as like a lot of these topics of the conversation can be, what I really respect is like you are my friend, and I as a friend I know you're going to say I, I you know think you make some good points on this. I think you can improve on that but that's what friends are for. And so I really appreciate like having this opportunity and I just cannot reiterate to your, the viewers enough that I still make mistakes. I'm going to mess up. And I've probably said like a million things which are offensive already if it's not my intent, but I may have hit on those things. So. Yeah. You said um, you were talking about hundreds of years of uh, things that have gone on um, throughout our history and, and um, you, you talked about, you know, it's unbeknownst that there's information that people are just not aware of. And I mentioned a, a term when I did a presentation, uh, I did a workshop, I facilitated a workshop for you at University of Connecticut. And I mentioned this term, agnotology, because you were talking about people just being ignorant and not knowing. 
hundreds of years of, of things that have happened in our history. So this term, agnotology, the study of culturally induced ignorance, when we think about the information that people just do not know and how they respond and how they move and how they behave based off of ignorance, um, we know for sure that things have been selectively omitted out of our textbooks. And it's not just white people that don't know um, history. A lot of black people don't know history either because our history is uh, that we know of is based on what we have seen in the text. And so when we, of course, we learned about slavery and slaves, slave owners were bad and they beat people and they raped and they dismembered, you know, black people. But then we come to, but you all were freed. You know, you, you, you have your freedom now and all men are equal now. And the textbooks omitted some of the things that you were even sharing um, about the underlying reasons as to why um, people who are disenfranchised or marginalized, the underlying reasons as to why they end up in jail or, you know, end up using sub substance, substances or abusing substance. Um, and so when we think about the ignorance, we don't learn about redlining. We don't learn about vague vagrancy laws in the textbooks. We don't learn about Black Wall Street. Um, we don't, you know, all the ongoing segregation. Um, Carol Anderson, she wrote a book called White Rage. And she said that white people's rage, we always talk about Black people's rage and getting out into the streets and and destroying things. And she talks about how subtle white rage is and how it's cloaked in the legalities and policies and different uh, policies that have been constructed in fear and part of the rage to keep black and brown people from being able to uh, progress. And so um, when we think about that, what would you say about the impact of agnotology on our nation and, and progression in our nation? So it's a it's a very like interesting concept, and I think uh, I think it's a an appropriate description. And with that, though, like I uh, I don't necessarily only consider it from like a textbook perspective. I also kind of consider it from like a, a human perspective. And so. Uh, uh, like for us, like we're so passionate about counseling that we uh, devote our lives to be counselors. Uh, I think about like, um, I think about like some people uh, that I really enjoy like being connected with for services. And so uh, the dentist I go to, like uh, like last year I was eating some paella and there was like a, a pit of an olive that cracked my tooth. And so I was able to go and see the dentist the next day. And this guy's focused in on dentistry. Like that's his passion. Teeth are his passion. I don't share that passion. When I think about some of that, I think that uh, some of that ignorance kind of is connected with some of our passions and the things that we can be driven to. Uh, and because of that, I think that what that does is that may unfortunately kind of narrow us and narrow our perspective. And then the other things that we were taught, like when you specifically identify like information in the text and things that were left out, that just stays. So uh, if I'm passionate about like, let's say I'm passionate about um, like the fa my favorite job I ever had, I was a projectionist at a movie theater. I loved that job. If uh, back in the eighties, that job paid like 46 bucks an hour. Uh, but when I got the job in the nineties, it was like six bucks an hour, but I loved that job. Uh, if for the people that made it their full-time job back in the eighties, that's all they were focused on. And I think what kind of happens is then uh, people that share the same passion end up conglomerating. So like we're counselors, we have the American Mental Health Counseling Association. And within that, I think that kind of narrows a lot of our perspective. When we talk about like a lot of those things that are being om omitted, how do we then help people who have passions in other areas to help obtain this information? And I, I think, I think there can be ways. I just don't necessarily have the answer for that, but I definitely think obviously it has done damage because I, I think that uh, I, we are still in a, a disconnected, I hate to say, but segregated society in that, mm -hmm. like, and that, I, I don't mean to say that, like, uh, I'm not trying to say that in, like, a, a, a bad way, like, you know, someone's 
telling me I can't talk to black people, but I, I think about what, what makes my friends and I connect and it's the, the things that we share passions for. So, uh, me being like in a heavy metal band, um, we toured over in China. I had no idea that uh, I didn't know that heavy metal was big in China, but when we met people in China that like shared our same passion for metal and had all the same things in top, like we would have the same conversations with people in China that we would have with our friends in Buffalo, like that as, as ridiculous as it sounds, the otherism that was there disappeared. Mm. And I wish that we were able to kind of connect with that. But as those things are that, um, that ignorance is there, we then just take what we think we know. And I'll be the first one to say uh, that includes me as well. The things that I think I know, and I don't necessarily challenge those things. I think like us being in the counseling profession, especially currently with a, with everything that's happening, we're rather blessed to challenge ourselves yeah, and have a difficult discussions. Um, but if I was a projectionist and I, I hate to admit this, but I'd be focused on like, all right, how is this movie looking? How's it coming through? Is the sound working? All right. I, as ridiculous as that sounds. Uh, so but I, but that, but I definitely, yes, I think we've been extremely negatively impacted by that because we naturally gravitate towards people that share our interests. Some of those things are disconnected by cultures and within that we may not challenge ourselves to get beyond our comfort zone. And I am the first one, I'll admit I absolutely do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I um, think about what you said that um, we, you know, we, we kind of stay in our lane. That's what you're saying. Um, we, we stay in our lane. We, connect with those people who have the same interests that we have. But in staying in our lane, I've been sharing in previous lives um, with some of the other topics that whatever lane that we are in, just as I am doing tonight, just as we're sharing tonight, that's a, that's a movement forward providing education. This is educational. For a lot of people, they will be hearing something tonight. You shared it. I don't have a, as large of a white audience as you have. Your, your friendship um, with white people clearly, probably, I'm sure, is greater than mine. And so somebody in your friend group is hearing information tonight, possibly for the first time. And so I think in our own lane and in that whatever small way that we can make change in our profession as we're you know, doing assessments with some of our clients, I think it's very important for us to be mindful of those assessments that um, you know, culturally um, assessing for cultural issues and or cultural traumas or, or things like that and bringing awareness to people that may be experiencing some sort of ra trauma from racism that they don't even know to connect to that. And so whatever profession you're in, whatever lane you're in, we posted a video by Jane Elliott uh, before we came on. And this woman is 87 years old. And back in the 1960s, she was on it. She made a decision that I'm going to be anti-racist. She wasn't willing to just say, oh, I'm not a racist. Oh, I'm not a racist. She says, I'm going to be an anti-racist. And I'm going to ask you to, to explain in a minute the difference between I'm not racist and being an anti-racist. But she was also an educator. So she stayed in her lane. She provided education to those young children um, she did her, you know, she was famous for that blue eyed, brown eyed experiment back in the um, 60s where, you know, she asked all the blue eyed uh, people to step to the side. And um, and it, it was a very powerful uh, uh, video. And I, I, those of you, it's on my um, page. So I should, you should definitely click on and, and watch it if you didn't watch it prior to the show. But um, yeah, so she was uh, very, very in, intentional about being an anti-racist. What's the difference between someone saying, I'm not racist, you know, I have black friends. I, you know, I, my daughter married a black man. I'm not racist. What's the difference between I'm not racist and being an anti-racist? Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, uh, ab great questions for sure. And I think, um, like I said, like uh, when I was growing up, what that word racism meant, that didn't necessarily meant that I engaged in anti-racist activities, though. 
Uh, so, and there is a difference. So like, um, and this kind of uh, asks us to all really consider our core beliefs and what our core beliefs actually mean. And if we are adhering to those core beliefs, um, I think that I can't speak for all of my friends, but I think the vast majority of my friends would say that if they observe oppression, that they would want to step in and prevent someone from being oppressed. However, there are instances where there are what we talk about microaggressions or things where, where there's just ongoing problems and we just kind of accept that that it's just the way that it is. Mm -hmm. And being anti-racist is a, a verb specifically in action to try to enhance, enhance the lives of marginalized people. And we could do that specifically with in various ways. I think, um, I think where people kind of get caught up in it is the prescription of the answer. And I think that is always the hardest thing. And uh, from my experience of uh, senior like management, like policy change inside of a company is difficult. So let alone policy change at like a national level with a heterogeneous, heterogeneous society is it's extremely difficult. And so I think that a lot of times people might kind of get stuck on the prescription as to how to improve things. Uh, and when we talk, you know, I, I appreciate you kind of validating that aspect of staying in our lanes. Like when we see things that happen like on a daily basis or even on a small basis, jumping in, trying to make sense out of it and using an opportunity for a growing um, a growing experience. So as I specialize in the treatment of transgender individuals, uh, when I was working at the Westchester Medical Center, uh, one of my supervisees, he uh, misgendered a trans patient. And it's really tough for someone to be misgendered who's transitioning. And so within that, it, the, the, uh, my supervisee, he felt terrible. And he, as soon as the words came out of his mouth, he knew what he had said had negatively impacted the person. However, when that happened, it happened in a group session. And so if he had stopped to try to like assess this in the group, he could have exacerbated and fully uh, gotten more of the experiences that maybe this patient didn't want to bring up to everyone. And so we had the individual contact the, the patient and not only apologize, but also accept responsibility as to how the words can be detrimental. Mm -hmm. And and saying, you know, listen, like, uh, I'm really committed to working with you. Uh, one of these things that, you know, this is like a process for me, too. And as I'm committed to working with you, it's totally okay for you to talk about, like, how frustrated you might be and you might feel. And I think it's important for me to hear that. And, like, the uh, relationship was repaired. And what was helpful uh, for this patient is for someone who's transgender, not everyone in the world is going to be affirming of their gender identity, helping the individual identify tools to uh, kind of like manage, because we can't control what other people are going to say, but helping the individual identify tools to get through that interpersonally is effective. So this was a growing experience for both people, but the individual chose ownership of it. And like, it, so, I mean, there's instances where you have to, as an individual, like take ownership of the things that we're messing up with, those little things that we do, and then accept that feedback and also when we see other things that are incorrect, also call it out as well. And um, we, we will still see them, especially like in a treatment setting. I'm sure there's been times where you've been running treatment groups and someone will, will say something that's so like incredibly racist, like you're almost like, did I just, wait, did they, did they just say that? And you're trying to like make sense. Like, did they mean like, how did this person mean that? And then like, how do I follow up with this? And having to like interrupt and say, uh, let's kind of assess uh, where you're coming from with that statement. Let's get some feedback from everyone else. Let's see how that statement came across. Let's see how that person feels. And let's see, let's see what your thoughts are about that. And it's a hard thing to say, especially when someone would say I'm not racist while they just said something which is really invalidating. And, uh, but that's some of the things that we have to do, absolutely. And, um, yeah, in our um, in our profession, it makes it a little bit easier, um, and it's it, it's it's expected sometimes that you know we would challenge. But my question, um, you're saying take ownership and you know challenge people. Would you feel comfortable challenging your friend? You know, would you as when I when I think of anti-racist, it and I know I said let's stay in our lane. But then we have friendships, you know, we have people that we're in relationship with. Would you challenge a friend if you heard them say something and there were no other black people in the area, you know, but, it, you know, in, in your group, but they said something that was racist, you know, would you challenge a friend? Uh, like I, I'm very lucky that uh, 
I'm very lucky. Let's uh, if let's kind of take this off of racism for just a second. I'm very lucky that in my real life, I'm a jerk and I mess up all the time. And I'm very lucky to have friends that love me beyond that and are still there with me even when I've done stupid things and made an idiot out of myself. And the good thing about that relationship is as they've been able to love me through that, uh, I feel very comfortable uh, confronting my friends in regards to those issues. And my friends might say, you know, dude, I, I don't agree with you. And what we, what we, they may not necessarily agree with, with everything I'm saying, mm -hmm. but if I can like isolate a specific part of that aspect, like, all right, so when you're saying this, I think you're feeling this. Yes, that's true. Now imagine if someone heard something entirely different based on what you said, would you then want to re reconsider what you're saying? And they're like, well, my intention isn't to hurt someone. So therefore I would, I would reconsider what I'm saying. So even like having some of that flexibility and I'm lucky that uh, I, I feel very blessed that my friends have allowed me to challenge them. But not only that, like my pastor has allowed me to challenge him. You know, like my, uh, the people I, I go to church with have allowed me to challenge them. We're, we're allowed to have these discussions where I, uh, and also it's not about winning. Uh, sometimes I just have to agree that it's, I'm, I can't change a person right then and there. Uh, I think like, and that's tough because when we see something bad, we want it to change right away. Mm -hmm. And people are people, we change slowly, we change over time. And that's part of that aspect of like, all right, okay. So I, knowing, knowing that delicateness as to like, how do I build off of this? Am I planting a seed or, or, you know, but sometimes I have to accept that I cannot force a person to change. Right. And that's hard. Right. Um, I, I like that you, what you're saying is that you, um, you take ownership, you know, for where you are, you take ownership for your own growth, you take ownership for your mistakes, and you are willing to stand up and say what needs to be said, whether the other person, um, you know, agrees or not. And I would put that in the category of being um, an ally, you know, for anti-racist is supposed to be an ally and be able to um, you know, step in and say, hey, you know, what you said, that, that just didn't line up with, you know, with humanity, you know, it wasn't a statement that was very nice. And, um, and, and I appreciate your uh, honesty in, um, you know, and how you handle your relationships. And it's great that you have those relationships that are open like that, and, and that you have that group of friends that you can, you know, that you can share with. We have these friends that we grow up with. Um, you know, my children grew up in a um, not as diverse neighborhood as um, we would have liked, but um, had a lot of white friends. And um, now that, you know, we, we are in this racial tension and all that's going on in our country, and when, you know, we would post, you know, Black Lives Matter or my children post Black Lives Matter, when a white friend uh, responds with the all lives matter, I was sharing how deflating that is and how we then begin to reevaluate, you know, is this really a friend? Is this ignorance? Is this what, you know, we have to go into this. What is this? When you hear, you're my friend, when you hear Black Lives Matter, what does it mean to you? What comes to your mind? Mm -hmm. So uh, when I remember the like the first time I heard it, so there's uh, like the words Black Lives Matter. And I, I think I conceptualize this from like my counseling perspective. And so when I like first heard that, like I had some education specifically about marginalized populations. And my thought was like, I, uh, my honest experience was I felt sad. The fact that these words needed to be said that a uh, full like community of people have felt so disconnected from uh, the United States community as a whole. And like, you know, when we think about this, like growing up in the 80s, 90s, the vast majority of superheroes we would see on TV would be white. Commercials would be white. Uh, like there was just like a very white dominant culture. And so we could talk about, you know, things that are important to us, like spiritually, and then things how are also disconnected, like culturally. And then also when you kind of couple that in with like experiences of police brutality, instances where like uh, uh, when we're talking about policy, which has been uh, detrimental to the black community, the fact that those words needed to be said was sad to me. And it made sense as to why it needed to be said. Um, 
although it was sad because I, I, yeah. I, I hated the idea of anyone feeling that someone needs to say my life matters. Within that, when I do have a core belief that all lives, you know, to God matter. I'm a Christian and therefore like all lives matter. I think sometimes people, when they see black lives matter, they may misinterpret that, that only black lives matter. Okay. <laughs> that I, I consider that there's the, when I re- hear black lives matter, when I hear those words specifically, what I hear is like an inclusion to life mattering. And so if all lives matter, black lives and the experiences of black individuals matter. An inclusion to life, meaning at that moment we're feeling excluded. Yes. So when we kind of think about like what, uh, so if if all life matters, and I 100%, I, I, I do agree with that. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be coming off as uh, uh, unsupportive of what you're saying. I could see how that feels deflating. But if I honestly do feel that all lives matter, I have to then look at the experiences of individuals who have been it taught or been inferred that their life doesn't matter. And how can, how can we hear the experience of this individual? How could we hear an experience of a group where they're feeling that their lives don't matter? And that's really important because I do have the belief that all lives matter. And if a group of people are feeling disconnected from their life mattering, then I have to do something to show that all lives matter. Does that make sense? Is it, yeah. Um, like, the way that you are explaining it is very different from just someone discounting um, our our feelings of being excluded from humanity, right? So when you say that um, if all lives do matter, when you put it that way, if all lives do matter, then I do have to look at that one who is feeling excluded, that one who has been marginalized and and needs to even say my life matters. And I usually give that example that when um, when a person's house is burning down, everyone's house on the block is important to the fireman. But and if if all the houses were burning down on the block, they would come and and treat all the houses, you know, douse all the houses with water. But if only one house on the block at the moment is burning down they're going to focus on that one house. It's not that the other houses would not have been important if, you know, if, if they were on fire as well. And so right now in our country at the moment, um, black lives are the ones that are on fire. And so it does not discount that all lives matter. But when we, when that statement is just said and there seems to be no um, understanding of of, of where we are and why we're saying what we're saying, then it's hurtful. Absolutely. And what I, when you, when you describe that too, I, I really like the analogy of the burning house and uh, let's really kind of stick with that analogy. Now imagine the, uh, imagine the fire, uh, f- uh, the fire uh, station comes over and instead of throwing water on it, they throw gasoline on it. Mm. And uh, I think that's, I think unfortunately that's what's happened in our country, sometimes best attempts to make things better. We've created policies that have made things worse. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to, and I think what happens is as this discussion becomes politicized, it becomes less humanized. Someone's house is burning. Someone is suffering. There's nothing wrong with just listening and hearing specifically what's happened to that individual and reevaluating some things that have contributed to that. And I, th- I do definitely believe in personal responsibility. I, I do believe in that. And I also have to accept the things that are outside the individual, which contribute to an individual making a, an individual choice. And so those things can come together. I think what stinks is when those things are in opposition. It would be great if we we're able to put the house, not only put the house out, but then restore the house and be able to uh, provide a better environment like that would be that's that's great but as everything kind of does get politicized and uh, people will attack each other i think what uh, what happens is not only is one house on fire but then it makes other people run away from the person whose house on fire they feel disconnected and that's not mm-hmm. that's not my view of a community but that's also one of those things i have to ask myself all right did well and what ways have i tried to put out a fire and what ways have i tried to make things better and that's something i have to like continue to work on to try to do and when you talk about like staying in our lanes like it's easier to do i think in the area of counseling but also to do within my personal life as well yeah yeah 
So that's one one of the terms that I feel um, today is it can be very divisive um, when we're trying to create um, uh, unity. Another term that I think is quite divisive that we have heard um, for the last four years is make America great again. And I feel like that is dividing um, us as a country. What are your thoughts about make America great again? Yeah, yeah. So like this is really, really tough. So it's okay for you to, <laughs> it's okay if you want you to totally disagree with me. I remember when I first heard that though. And I, uh, and as much as like we're, we, we talk about policy, I don't want to get too much in regards to like a political discussion, but I do absolutely pay attention to politics. I like reading policy. I like reading the specific nuts and bolts of a policy and how a policy particularly works. Uh, when I first heard Make America Great Again, I wasn't conceptualizing it from a perspective of otherness. I wasn't conceptualizing from a, from a perspective of like... Uh, we don't care about the needs of other people. My honest, my honest to goodness thought was when I first heard "Let's Make America Great Again," I thought about middle class workers whose jobs have moved, and the inability to uh, connect and provide for family and uh, economy. That was the very first thing that I thought. Unfortunately, those words "Make America Great Again." People hear "Make America White Again." Mm -hmm. People hear, you know, "Make America." Uh, like, yeah, like uh, not only white, but also like screw the needs of anyone that's marginalized. And so a lot of those things kind of get thrown in that. That was, but I mean, if I'm being totally honest and transparent, when I first hear that, just like when we talk about the needs of like individuals, I, I do conceptualize also like, you know, if we think about like policy and we think about there, unfortunately, are people who, if they looked back 10, 15 years ago, they would feel that their lives were better because their jobs were there. And of course they want to make America great again. They're thinking about when things were better five or 10 years ago. Other people are thinking like, oh yeah, let's make America great again when there was segregation. Let's make America great again when people didn't have rights. And that is also unfortunately attached to that. So it makes sense when, when people tell me they hate that saying, when people tell me that they feel disconnected from that and how they can feel that's aggravated because for some people, like uh, the experience of their lives have been so uncomfortable where they have not felt connected to the, the good things that America can provide because those things have not been provided for that individual. And so it, it makes sense how that could be offensive to people. I, I, it makes sense. Yeah, and um, in, in my transparency, when, <clears throat> when I hear people talk about Make America Great Again, I don't, I don't really know. I, I, for me, in my group, I am considered privileged, um, but I don't really know that collectively as a group of black and brown people that we could ever really process or put our finger on when America was really great for black and brown people. So the again, we just don't have an again. For us, it's when is America going to be great for us and for, for all of us together. And, um, that kind of, and I can't speak for all black and brown people, but the, I have to say that I don't think that we think generally speaking in terms of patriotism when it comes to America. I don't think that that's our first thought of how much we love our country. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that. I mean, like, uh, when you describe that, so uh, we started off specifically talking about, like, uh, my experiences growing up in a family with my last name being Dombrowski. Like, um, I'm of Polish descent. Now, uh, about, like, 10 years ago, uh, like, living in Buffalo, I would come out to New York City every once in a while. So I had some friends in New York, and they were from Germany. And then uh, in Buffalo, I'd go to Toronto a lot, and I met some people from Poland. And uh, the people from Poland and the people from Germany did not care what my last name was. They both treated me like I was American. Mm -hmm. But when I told them, like, I told the uh, individual in New York that I had a, she was uh, German. I told her I had a friend that was from Poland. She described how much she did not like the Polish individual, and the Polish individual talked about how she didn't like this German person. They did not know each other, mm -hmm. and they were still egg. Like I'm sorry to say this, and I, I don't want to minimize this, especially from the experience of Polish people. This is where my Americanness comes in, but they're still really like frustrated about the things that happened during World War II, as Poland was ripped apart, and then Poland became a part of the USSR up until the 1990s. So there's still like some, there's still that stuff that's there. So when we kind of think about like a disconnection to patriotism, that ability to kind of buy in, it makes sense. 
especially if people have felt like they have not had the opportunities. Like there are people that can come to the United States and talk about like uh, how thankful they are to be here and how thankful they are to take steps to to make life better while there are other people who are here and as they've been disconnected with certain things they have been marginalized they have been uh specified they have been othered and it would make sense an individual would say you know i don't know if things have ever been great here yeah and you you talk about um the things that polish people refer to that happened during world war ii so in our profession we know about transgener transgenerational transmission. Well, I study, I mean, I'm a manager family therapist, so my um, my training was in systems and what happened generations before. And so what they're speaking of is really transgenerational um, feelings and thoughts, you know, and, and that's the same thing that we experience. You know, um, I wasn't a slave, but transgenerationally, um, there are still the after effects. There are still the things that the behave, the mindset, the behaviors, the, the, and after slavery, the ongoing assaults uh, to the um, to the group to uh, to us as a group. It it definitely you know affects even if we are privileged within our group, we still feel the after effects. And when, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but when you talk about that, I remember uh, at the presentation you did for the University of Bridgeport, you talked about like uh, something that I never heard of. And it was like the event when uh, it was uh, the the Black Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And that I think that was like in the 1800s or early 1900s. It wasn't that long ago. Well, how long? Yeah, it was, it, it was in the 19, like the 1950s. So 1950s, here's a group of uh black individuals who are trying to make their lives better, trying to be self-sustainable, trying to take steps and take advantage of the American dream. And their property, the things that belong to them were destroyed. So, destroyed, oh God, destroyed, like blocks and blocks and blocks uh, burned down. See, absolutely. Yeah. So that, that was in the 1950s. So I believe I it was the 1950s. Someone who is a historian can correct me, but yeah. Well, even let's even say just for like the sake of argument, it was even the 1920s, yeah. whatever. But the thing is we're, we are still, it would make sense that we'd still be generation, generationally impacted by that. If someone came and burnt down everything that I worked for, I would not trust an individual and I want to, I would not trust the systems that that individual is then assigned to. And then if I have children, I would teach my children not to trust. Right. And then they would see things that would then affirm that. And so those things are there and those things, those things have happened. And I think because of the ignorance, because of the lack of knowledge, that's why um, we here as um, Black people, but that happened so long ago. You're still talking about it. It really wasn't that long ago. When you talk about uh, generation, my grandfather, you know, my it would have been in, you know, only one generation, two generations, I should say, um, ago. And so we are still affected. We're still hearing the um the stories we're here these are not folklores these are these are real happenings you know that that our um people experienced and so um again due to ignorance the thought is oh slavery was so long ago why are we still talking about this because we're still having um the the negative impact of it that's why we're still talking about it so, uh, so with that, um, Fred, and we're, we're coming close to, to the end, um, we posted a, a question on Facebook and it, it asked, and I'm asking you, how would you respond to this? Um, are white people, we talk about ignorance and we talk about agnotology and, and, and being some people being purposeful about not becoming educated because when you're educated then you are put in a place of being somewhat responsible um, for for change and so the question is do you believe that white people have a responsibility for using their privilege to dismantle the system of racism so i think uh I definitely have to say yes, and though I don't think it's only white people. Mm -hmm. uh, so because uh, we, um, at the university, we just had another 
uh, follow-up discussion from the discussion that you had over the summer where we had some like local clinicians kind of come in and, and uh, the clinicians, we had a, a diverse background of clinicians. So uh, one was black, another clinician was Hispanic, and another clinician was white. And I appreciated the black and Hispanic clinician specifically identifying how they also struggle with racist thoughts and and the things that like impact them even towards members of their own race. And mm -hmm. so I definitely think that white people, we definitely have to accept and, and take steps. I don't think that that alone is enough because, uh, uh, and what I appreciated about this as well, one of my, one of our former students, she was an African-American woman. Uh, she's now a counselor. It, uh, we did another event where we had uh, alumni come back and talk to the students. And she was just, she was identifying like her experience as a black woman and how she never wanted to work with white men. But as she had that opportunity to do that, she was able to connect. And she felt like, especially working with individuals who may maintain like racist thoughts and, and beliefs, can we think of about anyone who would benefit more from counseling and how she kind of feels that she's helping to make a difference because of this. And so I appreciated that she even challenged her own self about that as opposed to saying, you know, all white people are bad. She then conceptualized it like, you know, people are suffering suffering now that's not that doesn't mean that it's okay to make people what do what they do we do know that when people suffer though it's hard for them to go outside and do some additional learning to push themselves and uh, so i think that yes we have a responsibility to do but i i the nfl this is so cliche but they have that statement in the in the back of the end zone it says it takes all of us i do definitely think it, it there's definitely a part that we have to do mm -hmm. uh, I, if that was only it that would be great, but I, I don't, I just don't conceptualize it that way. I think there's, there's instances that we all have to do. And I agree with that. I do think that um, if we're talking about white privilege and we're talking about the collective, there are some things that as black and brown people that we just don't really have the power to do. But um, we absolutely do have our, resp and I want to be a part of change. I don't want to, I don't want to sit back and necessarily wait for someone else to create change. But my prayer definitely is that as we provide this education and as each one chooses to reach one, each white person chooses to reach another white person and that one reach another mm -hmm. and, and the education becomes, um, you know, significant enough that people would literally say, wow, I, I take ownership to this um, and, and all of us, you know, taking ownership to the part that, you know, we can play. Um, I'm just looking at some of the, the uh, comments. I, I didn't see the comment before. So the Black Wall Street was in the 1920s, um, uh, not the 1950s, but still. Yeah, that's absolutely. not that yes. long ago, yes. you know, it is mm -hmm. not that long ago. And um, another comment that was made that I thought was good and just... I don't know where it went, but someone um, commented when, when I talked about having patriotism as, um, you know, black and brown people, the comment was, it's not a matter of us not loving our country. And I liked what she said. The, the, the question is, why doesn't our country love us? Yeah. That's and that kind of, yeah, that goes back to that, that saying black lives matter, yeah. like specifically and like uh, how, and uh, as a counselor, um, so like I'm you I've worked with you you know me I'm like I'm captain objective like I I do quantitative research and I love cognitive behavioral therapy now with that we challenge our thoughts all those other things but uh, one thing I learned at a conference like a couple months ago it was that um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care mm -hmm. and I can definitely uh, we know for sure that a lot of people are feeling uncared for. Yeah. In, in various ways and it doesn't matter we can say oh look I did this I did I did that and that does that's not enough it's just it's and it's not necessarily the action of what you've done sometimes those actions are like i did this and i'll get off my back yeah. like i love my girlfriend i absolutely love her and there's times where she could be totally annoying me and i'll do whatever she wants just to get her off my case that doesn't mean that i don't love her but that doesn't come off like i sincerely wanted to do what she wanted me to do yeah. and i think that there we really have to kind of separate like action versus like uh, a genuineness the, a devotion to try to and improve things as opposed to saying, all right, I did this now, stop talking about it. There's more to it than that. Yeah. And sometimes that's what we feel. We feel like just enough is enough. Okay. I'll do this. Is that enough for you? And it, you know, it, it, it feels like there's the distant, you know, disingenuous, 
disingenuous is that the word no Dis disingenuous i think or <laughs> lack, lack, lack of genuineness yes <laughs> lack of genuineness yeah and so um that that's that's what we feel sometimes fred we have been talking a long time yeah this is awesome like uh, <laughs> i we didn't went... realize i mean i'm enjoying the conversation i didn't realize the time and I thank all of you who have been hanging out with us and are um, hanging out and staying with us, um, even though we are um, well over an hour. We're coming to the um, end, and I, I do want to. I wanted to um, ask you, what do you think? And I know that none of us have all of the answers, but what do you think would be um, an answer that would bring us towards what we would consider racial harmony? Um, I know that our president-elect Joe Biden, his his uh, slogan was um, to address the healing of the soul of America. And right now, um, black people, brown people, we 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 really feel our soul has really been assaulted, um, and, it, and our souls have been assaulted. Then, and and we are American then the soul of America has been assaulted. And so, you know, what, is, what do you think is going to take to bring this racial harmony? And that's a, uh, that's a very big uh, question. And I, I really thank you that you said like, no one has the right answer. When you describe that though, I kind of go back to like, this is where, like, where my spirituality kind of comes in. Cause unfortunately this question is just too big for me. Like I know from like a counseling perspective, like interpersonal interactions that are going to build success that's great like i know how we can get a, i know how people can genuinely get along but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're healing uh, healing is a really difficult process mm -hmm. from my experience of working with individuals who've experienced trauma and i just really want to preface this that i i can understand what i'm saying is going to be very offensive but this is the first thing that came to mind and i don't think this is the only thing but this does kind of connect with my spirituality and so i think about like when uh I forgot it wasn't it was uh maybe it was Peter who asked Jesus if my enemy uh sins against me seven times how many times do I have to forgive him and he said do I have to forgive him, forgive him seven times he said like 70 times seven or something like that it's a really hard thing to ask people to forgive and it's a very hard thing to ask people to forgive especially when an individual is still hitting I know for the individuals I've worked with uh that for forgiveness aspect is, or making sense out of the experience was a part of their healing process. I can't tell you how to heal. And I could 100% identify how it's inappropriate and privileged to say, we will, I, I think forgiving is a path of improving. That's one aspect of it though, but I, that's based on my experience as a clinician. Because when the soul, of, when you said someone's been assaulted, if someone feels powerless, if someone's feeling hurt, if they feel broken, that sticks with them and it sticks mm -hmm. throughout the generations. And so I don't know how I can take that away. I, I, I don't know. I do know that I'm a developed, uh, I am uh, trying to do better from my perspective, from my little bubble and hope in my bubble, but I don't know how I can improve the soul. I think one of the things I can do is definitely listen when people disagree. And I could still even disagree, but I, th I think first and foremost, I have to hear. Mm -hmm. And take like, and there are, even if I disagree with prescription, how people can solve the problem, I think it's still important for me to, to hear specifically all the aspects of the problem. I think that's really important. So, but when you ask that, I, like I said, I want to recognize like, it's really inappropriate for me to talk about like forgiveness when people are hurting. And, but I just think about like my experience, like spiritually and also from that aspect, uh, I'll give you a, uh, a subjective experience. And I like this cause you're a qualitative researcher, mm -hmm. even though I don't like, but, uh, there was this, this kid I used to work with back at the movie theater. Um, he like, he was good, but he was kind of annoying. He was kind of a pain in the ass. And there were instances where he and I, we just like butted heads. And I would never went out of my way to like make life suck for him. But you know what it's like when you would see someone and it's totally happening. You would see someone and you just didn't want to be around them and you would feel irked and you'd feel frustrated. Has that ever happened to you? Well, no. you're a pastor. It's, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, so. No, I mean, I still get hurt. Um, I, I mean, yeah. people, people are people and they can frustrate you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so like, uh, but there was one day in Buffalo, there was a snowstorm and the movie theater closed during the snowstorm. And so my car was stuck in the snow and this dude helped me out with my car. Like my feelings of irritation immediately changed. I think that, so I think like a, as a white individual, but as an individual 
any individual. I, I have to do my best to help people out of the snow. I have to accept responsibility the times where I've messed up, but I have to do that. And then we can't change a mind unless we change a heart. And being right about an argument isn't going to change a, a mind. Our actions help. And I think that our, those actions help to heal. So I think like, yeah, there's that forgiveness aspect, but there's also those actions to help take people out of the snow. I right. think that's a really important part. So, yeah, so those are my thoughts. Like I said, I could understand how that could be offensive. I could understand how like, that could be frustrating because uh, it's hard for me to say some, someone did something really bad to you. And if in order for people to achieve, achieve health after that or achieve healing, uh, there is that process of forgiveness or making sense of it. I understand how that's offensive. Yeah. With that said, for people, though, that it's also helpful for us to help dig each other out of the snow. So that those yeah. are my thoughts on it. So it, it's easier. Forgiveness is a whole lot easier when when you don't have to forgive someone who is not asking for forgiveness. Oh yeah, you know, yes. it's a whole lot easier. And so you know, if someone were genuinely saying, "I'm so sorry," you know, "I'm so sorry that this is your story. I'm so sorry that this is your experience." And you know, what can I do? I don't know it all. I don't, but what what part can i play you know what kind of responsibility can i take for um for your story that makes forgiveness a whole lot easier uh -huh. but when of course as i mean i'm a pastor so of course the concept of forgiveness is not foreign and it's absolutely biblical and necessary but when we talk about forgiveness and it is ongoing it's, it's hard. hard. It's a yeah. hard sell, you know, yes. for, you know, for people, yeah. you know, how do you forgive when it is ongoing? And so then we go into, you know, coping, you know, coping, we made the decision to forgive. So how do we cope with, uh, with it's going to happen again tomorrow, you know? Mm -hmm. And so th those are, are some of the realities, but when we can get wh white allies, it helps. It really does help. Genuine people who are genuine that say, I really don't know what you're experiencing and I'm not going to make light of it, but I would like to come alongside and I would like to be an ally and I would like to share um, in, in whatever part that I can in being responsible. And then, you know, we're talking about heart change, but we do need policy changes. And mm -hmm. And we can march with, as black people, we can march all day long, every day. But until white people come alongside and are willing to fight for those policy changes, um, there are some things that, you know, our hands are still very tied. They've mm -hmm. been tied and they're still tied. Yeah. And, you know, I appreciate talking about that policy change because uh, policy has a ripple effect. And a policy that's not created effectively it can be it can be detrimental to what the goal of the policy is mm -hmm. and that's really kind of tough and and so i have a whole bunch of thoughts in regards to like politics leadership how people create policy none of which i think are like helpful like in this situation but i think uh when we kind of talk about policy i think like uh, trying to really look at so I, I have heard some members of Congress identify that they don't have the opportunity to look at every piece of policy that they sign. And therefore, that is uh, part of their cabinet to read. Because like some of the policies, actually, it's very big. It's very in-depth. Like So reading the Iraq like war resolution from 2004, it was like 20 pages, or but I read it. And like reading all the things like whereas this, whereas that, but that's what a, that's what it is like. And so people are making a decision to go to have an aggressive act against another nation based on this policy. So to hear people say, "Well, I you know I can't, I don't have the time to read everything that comes across my desk," then my thought is, "Then you don't have the ability to sign everything that comes across." I your agree. Desk. And I so I think there's that aspect of like abstaining if you, to say I just don't have enough information on it. So though I I think that's also, but I definitely do believe that policy is important as well. Yeah, I, I think it's also our our responsibility um, to understand where, where, whatever area that we're going to make change. I'm not I don't really know a lot about policy and I'm sure there are a lot of white people that don't know a lot about policy, but there are a lot that do. Um, and to understand the root of it and why it was created and, you know, why some of the, the laws 
um, uh, the the root and the foundation and what the intent was behind it is is important. Um, and so I agree. Don't that we shouldn't be in positions of signing policies that we don't know. You know, we just haven't read. Yeah, we haven't read. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Well, Fred, um, I appreciate, I, I think, to to wrap up um, how, you know, change can happen. I think it's going to happen one person at a time, um, making that intentional effort and keeping awareness, um, keep just being mindful and, and being aware and um, being willing to um, to communicate about it and not um, you know be hush hush and and or be fearful of the backlash. I think white people can be fearful of the backlash of speaking out, and it may seem like they are you know supporting or or not supporting another group means I'm not supporting my group, and so you know being able to move beyond that, and I, I think that that is a small beginning that, you know, um, that we can begin to experience some sort of harmony. And so, Fred, I really appreciate you coming on tonight. Um, as I, one of the things that I do at the end of each live, and I thank all of you again for staying with us this evening, but I usually close a live with asking people to take some time to sit, to think and reflect. There's a lot of information that was shared on this evening. Some information that some viewers uh, may even be uh, um, offended by. It's a possibility. Some people may still be in a place of feeling defensive. And um, my, my desire is for people to just take a minute to stop, to think, to reflect. Journal some of the things that you are feeling journal some of the thoughts that you are having as it relates to some of the information that you may have been educated about this evening or even you know if you are on the end of being you know a, a black person and you were listening tonight you may have had a trigger with some of the information that was shared journal you know put that down and and start to think and process what what am i feeling right now and why am i feeling it and um, you know, how, how can I, you know, do some um, self-reflecting in being able to uh, tr transition my thoughts in a way that are, you know, more healthy. Obviously, we can't give all kinds of counseling, you know, um, tips in one live, but I do like to end with that whole concept because we're always on the go. We may hear mm -hmm. something and then, you know, just move away from it. But just taking a little bit of time to process. Um, it's a lot of information that was shared and a lot of thoughts, a lot of, you know, perception. And so, again, I appreciate you coming on tonight, Fred. I appreciate your transparency um, and, you know, just being willing to, to be you. And <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. And so again, um, if you joined us tonight, let, let's just say thank you to Dr. Fred and um, thank him for all of the um, information that he shared and um, for, you know, just coming from, you just came from your heart, Fred, and I appreciate that. Like and share. It's not too late. Send this uh, video to all of your friends. And I hope that you do as well, Fred. I, I'm, I'm thinking that that will be a good start for you, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So, well, thank you so much. I definitely appreciate it. It's been such a pleasure to be uh, uh, be with you. And also, it's just always a pleasure just to talk to you anyways. Like, uh, yeah, and it's funny yeah. because I just felt like we had an opportunity to just talk. So this, is, this was a lot of fun. I definitely do appreciate it. Thank you. Good. I'm glad. Have a good evening, everyone. And we'll see you again next week. Take care.